dum, dum, what to dum, say dum, to the Lord it's dum, dum, you who gave me life and I dum, can't explain dum, just how dum, much you mean to me now dum, that you would say me Lord dum, dum, I give all that I am to you dum, dum, every day I will dum, dum, I'll be a light that shines your name single step I take and every day I will I'll be a light unto the world every day it's you I live for every day I'll follow after you every day I'll walk with you my Lord sing every day every day it's you I live for Be unto your name. 
be unto your name. This is the season for a new anointing. This is the season for a fresh outpouring. That the sons and daughters of the King of glory may arise and shine. That the sons and daughters of the King of glory may arise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. In the beginning God created, and for His pleasure all creation sings. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now arise and shine. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now arise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let your glory I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. King of glory, fill the earth. King of glory, fill the earth. King of glory. Place be 
enthroned on our praise arise king of kings holy god as we see
your light broke through my night, restored exceeding joy. Your grace fell like the rain and made this desert live. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. Your hand lifted me up. I stand on higher ground. Your praise rose in my heart and made this valley sing. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. This is how we overcome. 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 You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. This is how we overcome. 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 You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned. My morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. This is how we overcome. This is how we Oh, 
take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. I see a new revival stirring as we pray and sing. We're on our knees, we're on our knees. Hosanna, Hosanna. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Good morning. I want to welcome you to the Church of Christ at Oakdale to our online service this morning. Whether you're a member or whether you're visiting with us, uh, whether you just found us by accident, we're glad that you've come to worship with us this morning. Uh, we're going to sing songs of praise. I want to thank the Zoe group for leading us in those songs of praise. We're going to pray. We're going to read scripture. We're going to hear a message from the Lord's word this morning. Uh, we're going to take the Lord's Supper uh, together. Now, I know that sounds weird because we're in isolation right now, but one of the reasons that we are streaming this service at 10 o'clock is so that we are not alone as we're taking the Lord's Supper. But let us also not uh, forget that it's not just our congregation right now that's taking uh, communion, but there are people globally taking the bread uh, and, the, and the cup worshiping and, and thinking about the sacrifice of Jesus' body and his blood that he shed for us. We're also going to continue to have an offering. I know that sounds a little awkward and weird, but uh, we, continue, we, we ask that you continue to give online if you are able. We know many of you are in financial situations. We know that unemployment has hit an all-time high. And so if you're in a tough spot, that's okay. We understand. But if you can give, we encourage you to continue to give to the church. You know, I, I want to call us into worship at this time and, and just think about the assembly and how much it should mean to us and maybe how much we've taken it for granted. I read a quote this week by Dave Hollis that says, In the rush to return to normal, let us use this time to consider which parts of normal are worth rushing back to. Well, for me, the part of normal that I miss the most that I want to rush back to is worshiping with my brothers and sisters in person. To be sitting in my living room having e-group with people that I love dearly and to have people come over to my house for dinner and to sit around my table. I have to be honest, I've taken all of those things for granted and I miss them dearly. And so as we are settling into this new normal, at least for a little while, May we remember that though we are in isolation, we are not alone this morning. We are worshiping with brothers and sisters around the globe. But most importantly, God is in the midst of every living room, at every computer, wherever we are, he is there with us worshiping. So let's worship together today. I'm glad that you're with us. Glad you can join us. Glad that we can praise the Lord together.
These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert, crying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as wide in your world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. Let us adore, Let us adore the ever-living God. Throughout all the earth, He is our God. He is our God. He is our God. He is our God. There is no one else. He is our God. He is our God. He is our God. He is our God. There is no one else. I praise your name, I praise your name, most high and awesome God, most high and awesome God, and lift my hands, my hands, unto you, unto you, you save my soul, you save my soul, on a rugged tree, on a rugged tree, now I praise you, now I praise you, and serve you, Lord, throughout eternity. He is our God. He is our God. He is our God. He is our God. There is no one else. He is our God. He is our God. He is our God. He is our God. There is no one else. You are my God. If you'll pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, we give you glory this morning. In our thoughts, in our prayers, in reverent study of your word. And Father, by lifting our hearts and voices to you, truly you alone are worthy of our praise. And Father, as Christ came to this earth to reveal your kingdom to a broken world, let us daily reflect your love so that in a small way, we too may reveal your kingdom to the world around us. Father, you bless us so richly. At this time of uncertainty, Father, we pray that you sustain us. Give us our daily bread, give us health, give us food and shelter, 
But Father, more than that, give us peace and remind us of the great hope of Jesus in this storm of life. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us when we fall short. We all do so daily. Father, help us to remember your amazing grace for us as we forgive and love those around us. Father, this world of comfort and excess tempts us. Perhaps the greatest temptation is to simply focus on ourselves and on those we love. But Father, that is not what Christ did. Father, call us to live like Jesus. Call us to go, to step out of the boat onto the waves and to open our eyes to those beyond our friends and family. Father, lead us to love and give us faith to be strong when the path you call us to is difficult. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, we strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. And stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord. Lord of all, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the In the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong. In the Savior's love, through the storm, He This morning I'm going to be reading out of the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 7 through 11. I know we normally think of this as a book of law, but this morning I'd like you to think of this as a description of the culture that God wants for the people in his kingdom. So starting in verse 7, if there's a poor man among you, among your brothers in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Rather be open-handed 
and freely lend him whatever he needs. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts is near, so that you do not show ill will toward your needy brother and give him nothing. He may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to him and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all of your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you, be open-handed toward your brothers and toward poor and needy in your land. Sounds a lot like what we read in Acts 2, where the church shared everything that they had to take care of one another. It's funny, the first century church didn't have Acts 2 to read as to what they were supposed to do. I tend to think they got it from Deuteronomy 15. But think about this, in this time that we're in right now, how can we, God's people, being a people steeped in his culture, not be willing to give during such a difficult time as we're in right now? If you're struggling, know that the church is here for you. If you know people that are struggling, know that the church is going to be generous towards them. This is a time, if you have excess, to make it available to those who are struggling. I appreciate John reading the scripture for us from Deuteronomy chapter 15. It's a perfect springboard into where we're going today in James chapter 5. James is going to be talking about the tight-fisted. He's going to be talking about hoarding and self-indulgence. But here in Deuteronomy 15, we're reminded that God set it up for His people to be the people of the open hand, to be the givers. Let me read Deuteronomy 15, verse 11, one more time for you. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your brothers and towards the poor and the needy in your land. My goodness, do we need a reminder for that today or what? I went to Google this week and I just typed in toilet paper fights. And this is what came up on my screen. Uh, there's some videos. I don't encourage you to watch those. Uh, they're a little hard to watch. But here, here are just some, some images I found. Here's a, a man in Minnesota that has two pallets of toilet paper on top of it in, in, his, in his truck bed. And you have two women uh, fighting, uh, different, another fight in another store. People stockpiling for the great toilet paper apocalypse. It seems to come. Everybody's tight-fisted. Nobody wants to share. Well, I know that's not true, but it seems like all the pictures that are getting put in the media and that are up online are of people just having that tight fist. And we as the church have been called to be the people of an open hand, to be the givers and to take care of one another. So with that in mind, let's go to James chapter 5 and read what James has to say to these 12 tribes that are dispersed. To this letter, remember, he's sending to uh, to churches in general, not a specific church, but to many churches that are having the same issue of these quarrels and fights of this pride and this selfishness and this hoarding and this self-indulgence. So let's hear what James has to say. Are we hoarders or are we helpers? This is a warning against self-indulgence. James chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. Interesting language, harsh language. You thought the rest of the book of James was difficult. Now James is going to get even more difficult. Here we see that he's going to take off his hat 
as a teacher, and he's going to put on his hat of a prophet. If you notice the language that he uses in these verses, he says, weep and wail. He talks about last days. He talks about the day of slaughter. This is all prophetic voice like we hear from prophets like Jeremiah. Weeping and wailing, he even talked about that in chapter 4, a little bit earlier in his letter. He says, hey, you are having too much joy. You are finding too much laughter in this world, and it needs to turn itself upside down. You need to repent and come back to the Lord. When I think of my two favorite stories in the New Testament dealing with weeping and wailing, the first one is in Luke chapter 7 and verse 38. Jesus is at the house of a Pharisee, and this woman comes into a party uninvited, and she stands behind him, unable to look at him, unable to, she doesn't even want to bother him, but she is weeping and she is wailing over her sin. She's not just crying a tear, but it says she gets down on her knees and she's crying at the feet of Jesus. She cries so much that her tears wash his feet and she wipes them away with her hair. That's a sign of true repentance. That's the kind of repentance that James is calling for in his letter to these churches. But we also see this idea of repentance in Luke chapter 19. Jesus starts out the triumphal entry at the Mount of Olives and the scene that we usually have in our picture books and that we usually talk about is the crowd shouting and singing Hosanna in which they were. But it wasn't all just a wonderful, joyous scene. After that takes place, as Jesus is riding into the city and he sees Jerusalem in the distance, it says that Jesus begins to weep. And not just a tear. Jesus is crying. He's crying because he needs the people of Jerusalem to repent. He said, oh, if you, only you, would know who could bring you peace, but These things are hidden from you. So now James is using this same language. You need to weep and wail over the misery that is coming to you. Judgment has already been pronounced. It is coming unless they repent of their ways, of this tight-fistedness, and of this hoarding, and of this self-indulgence. So let's look at this a little bit deeper. James starts out by telling them, now listen, you rich people. Now, James doesn't have a problem with being rich. He's not talking about people that have entered a certain economic class. It's not like, hey, if you make 49,000, then you are considered in poverty. But if you make 50 grand, then we're going to consider you part of the rich. He doesn't have a salary in mind. He's talking about the haves and the have-nots and the way that the haves are treating the have-nots. And so uh, I want us to understand that this is not an indictment on wealth itself, but it's how this wealth is being used. You know, we see scriptures like 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. Paul says that it's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. He says some people are eager for money. They have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. We also have this parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12. Remember this guy? He's had a really good year. His crops have all come in. And think about it. Who has given him this great year? God is the one that's caused the crops to grow. And he's got this issue. He's got this problem. He's like, my barns have so much in them, I don't know what to do with this surplus. Oh, I got it now. You know what I'll do? I'll tear down the barns and I'll build bigger barns that way that I can have this for myself. And this parable of the rich fool ends with the man saying to himself, you have plenty good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. This is the kind of wealth in which James is warning against. This is the kind of self-indulgence, selfishness, this, this idea that, hey, it's all about me. This is why James says, now listen, you rich people. You know, as I was studying for this, I was trying to think, what, what would be an example of self-indulgence? How would I define self-indulgence? And so 
Uh, David Nystrom defines self-indulgence this way. He says, it's a life of luxury pursued at the expense of others and with an attitude of unfeeling dismissal. So it's not just, hey, I want what I want. It's I'm pursuing what I want at the expense of you. If I need to, as in this case with the landowners, if I need to have what I have and you don't get paid, well, then that's the way it's going to be. And I have this attitude of, hey, I, I understand that you're not eating, but I don't care. I understand that you, you can't take care of your family, but it's me first. This is that idea of self-indulgence. Recently, I was watching the film Titanic, and I know it's coming, but it's difficult every time I see it. As the ship begins to sink, everyone is trying to get on these lifeboats. And if you know anything about the story of the Titanic, this giant boat, which hosted 2,200 people, only had enough lifeboats for a little over 1,000 people. And so everybody's fighting. And you think about this self-indulgence. The rich were trying to get on first. They're trying to pay uh, the, the people on the boat to, to let them on or to let their friends and their family get on. And the interesting thing is a lot of these boats were lowered down into the water half full because they were afraid that too many people would get on and drown their boats. So think about the self-indulgence of this. You have the poor people that are kind of locked in the bottom of the boat. They won't even let them up to the top of the decks. You have the rich people getting into the boats and lowering them when they're not even full. And they're sitting there watching this ship sink. And they're watching people swim around in the water beginning to freeze to death. But yet they're not willing to do anything to bring these people into their boats. To me, this is one of the greatest examples of self-indulgence that I've ever seen. Seeing the cries and the pleas of the people and sitting in the boat, not willing to take anybody in. You know, church, we're in great danger if we're unwilling to go outside of our walls, if we're only willing to stay here and do what's right for us, do what's right to take care of our family, to put ourselves first and think, even in this coronavirus, hey, I'm good for a while. I can ride this thing out. And we think nothing about our neighbors. We're guilty of the very sin that James is talking about. So wherever you are on this pay scale, that's not what James is talking about. But if you are a have, if you had something and you see somebody who is a have not and you have the opportunity to help them, but you won't open your hand, but you keep a tight fist and you're hoarding whatever it is for yourself, we're in great danger. James says there are two cries that are going out to God. The first is the cry of the wages themselves, the injustice of the landowners not paying their workers. And the second cry is the cry of the workers themselves, crying out to God, pleading to Him for justice. It's interesting the title that James uses when he writes this verse. He says, They have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. The word literally means the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies. This is the God that comes with His heavenly host. This God that comes with an army. We see this in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, where Isaiah is standing before God and he sees the seraphs who are saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We see it again in Revelation chapter 4 as the living creatures shout basically the same thing. Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So we see James is bringing this charge to the Lord God Almighty. And what James is literally saying is, is that God is going to bring judgment. God is going to bring His army against the rich, the wealthy who hoard it for themselves. He will bring judgment against the rich, and He will defend His people. He will defend the oppressed, the ones who cannot stand up for themselves. You know, we're getting ready to take the Lord's Supper here in just a few moments. And the song actually says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And as we're taking the Lord's Supper, I definitely want us to be thinking about the cross. 
I want us to be thinking about the sacrifice made for us. But I want us to start to think about, is there any, anything in our lives that we're hoarding, that we're keeping for ourselves, in which God needs to bring an army and take away? And so we're going to take the Lord's Supper, and then we're going to come back, and I'll have just a few applications for us as we go about this next week. So let's, let's sing together. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb. See. sin and shame in love you came and gave amazing grace thank you for this love Lord thank you for the nail pierced hands wash me in your cleansing flow now all I know your forgiveness and embrace Worthy is the Lamb Seated on the throne Crown you now with many crowns You reign victorious The news these days is being watched hourly to keep track of a serious virus. We may be experiencing many different thoughts or feelings of loss and fear. Loss not seeing your family, loss of not being able to go out and eat at your favorite restaurant, loss of not being able to go to the mall or to shop at your favorite store. Not getting a haircut or hitting the gym, not going to just grab a cup of coffee or ice cream with friends. What about loss of assembling together in a church building? School time, work time, recreational time. We may experience fear. Fear about work or school. 
how to take care of employees, clients, coworkers, fear about finances, what about my job or the economy, fear for people's health, what's the number today, or now it's someone I know. In Matthew 26 and 36, we read of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here and I'll, as, while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is over, overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned with, to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more. And he prayed the third time, saying the same thing. How do you think Jesus felt? Do our thoughts or feelings even compare? As we come together via this technology, let us not think about what loss or fear we have. Rather, let's focus on Jesus, who knew what, he, what had to take place in order for all sinners to be given the opportunity to be saved. A horrible death on a cross through no fault of his own, but because of our sin. Let us focus on the sacrifice that gives us hope through him because of his death, burial, and resurrection. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we are together now, we are so thankful for this opportunity, for this time. But Heavenly Father, the thing that we are most thankful for is your son Jesus, for the sacrifice that he made for his body being hung upon a cruel cross. As we partake of this bread, let us go back and think of his body and the pain that he endured and suffered so that through him we might have forgiveness of sins. It is in your son's blessed name that we pray. Amen. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you now thanking you for the fruit of the vine which represents the blood that was shed through your son Jesus. We are so thankful for that sacrifice and as we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to be mindful of that sacrifice. We pray all these things in your son's most blessed name, amen. Our Heavenly Father, we know that as times change and things are different than as we know them, that we are still so blessed and that we need to build up our treasures in heaven and not here on earth. But Heavenly Father, there are things that we can do for your kingdom here on this earth. And at this time, as we give back a portion as you have prospered us, help us to be mindful of that kingdom in heaven and help us to do so with a cheerful heart. We pray all these things in your son's most blessed name. Amen. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power. Over all my dreams, 
In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Over every thought, over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. Cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? You are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? So what should be our response to the words that we've heard from James this morning? As we listen to His prophetic voice, we can choose to heed them or we can choose to ignore them. But if we want to be people of the open hand, if we want to get rid of our hoarding and start helping, how should we respond this very week? How can we put what we have learned today into practice? Well, I think the very first thing that we have to do is we need to weep and wail. And I know that doesn't sound like a lot of fun, But as I said last week, this is not just a simple, hey, I'll try to do better. We need to be like that woman in Luke chapter 7 who came to Jesus with her sin, weeping and wailing about it, and fall to our knees at His feet and cry so much that we could cover His feet with our tears and let Jesus lift us back up and to let Jesus say, you have been forgiven much because you loved much. You know, the Pharisees in that story and the people in this story that James is calling out, we don't really know how they respond to this letter. But there are many who are going to read these words and they're not going to change. They're not going to do anything about it. And Jesus will say to you and to me who don't want to change, you're going to be forgiven little because you loved little. You didn't see any need to repent. So the very first response, the proper response as we read this, the very first thing we should do is we should weep and wail when we see areas in our life in which we have been tight-fisted and hoarding our wealth rather than sharing it with those who are in need. We need to acknowledge the misery that is coming if we don't repent. But let me also say this. We need to also acknowledge the misery that our selfishness is causing to others. We need to acknowledge when someone else is hurting because we won't help. We need to acknowledge when somebody is hungry because we won't feed them. We need to acknowledge somebody who is in prison and we won't visit them. You know, this is how Jesus says, I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats. When a crisis comes about, how are we going to react? Are we going to be the sheep that serve Jesus? Or are we going to be the goats that serve ourselves. The second thing I think we need to be thinking about in a proper response is we need to examine our storehouses. You know, like the story in Luke chapter 12, the parable of the rich fool, he had an abundance of surplus in his storehouses, an abundance of crops, an abundance of harvest that he didn't know what to do with. And he put it all away for himself. And so what I want to ask you to do this week, especially as we're dealing with this coronavirus situation, is examine your storehouses. What do you have an abundance of? What are are things that you could use to help others? But also, you know, we might have to get a little sacrificial here. As a matter of fact, we're going to have to get sacrificial. It might be financial. It might be something completely different. It could be your time. It could be... Uh, sitting with somebody in need, but examine your storehouses. What do you have an abundance of? What has God blessed you with that you could use to be a blessing for others? You know, I I found this picture online this week and and it gave me a good little chuckle. 
this idea of putting uh, toilet paper into the collection plate. Toilet paper two weeks ago wasn't a commodity that anybody was thinking about as a rich resource. And now, if you have the Charmin, you're, you're rolling in it. Uh, no pun intended. But, you know, when I looked at this, this uh, picture for a little while longer, it reminded me of when I was in Zimbabwe at the Noe Mission at the school in 2010. As we went there to worship, I looked up there. As some of you that come from these old school churches, you remember up there um, on the stage towards the right or to the left. On one, you usually had the song numbers. And on the other side, what did you have? You usually had the list of, of the offering from this week or last week. And at this church in uh, Noe Mission, they had the offering. And underneath the offering was different items that were given where people didn't have money to give. And it said five pencils, three bars of soap, two notebooks. And I love that. I took a picture of it. I have it somewhere. I can't find it. But it stuck with me ever since then because no one wanted to come to God empty-handed. When they went into that worship, even if they didn't have money to bring, they were going to bring pencils, they were going to bring soap, they were going to bring notebook paper because they knew that that would be given to students at the school who didn't have pencils, who didn't have soap, and who didn't have notebook paper. So yeah, this is a funny picture, but there's reality to it. Whatever your resources are, let's think about ways in which we can open our hand to our brothers and sisters and to our neighbors. Finally, I just want to close with Micah chapter 6, verse 8. I can't think of a more fitting verse. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. We have to do justice. We have to act out justice. We have to live justly. We have to love mercy, and we need to walk humbly with our God. You know, as angry as I get about those pictures I showed you at the beginning with the pallets of toilet paper and the truck and the people fighting and the people hoarding for themselves, I need to be honest with myself and say, hey, maybe it's not toilet paper, but there's lots of things that I hoard and I keep for myself. Maybe it's that I don't want to branch out. Maybe it's that I want to keep to myself. Maybe it's that I don't want to share today, whatever that might be. We all have our own situations in which we are hoarding. And even if you think that right now, hey, Daryl cannot be talking to me. I have nothing to give, absolutely nothing to give. Let me remind you of this. There is nothing more priceless. There is nothing more valuable than sharing the gospel with somebody. So whether you feel like you have resources or not, you are a witness. You are a living testimony of what Jesus has done for you. Don't be tight-fisted about that. Open your hand, open your Bibles, and share with somebody that's in need, not only physically, but spiritually. You know, we see this pattern, this idea of that, that James uses of repentance that leads to humble submission. And when there is humble submission, there is transformed hearts. And when there is trans transformed hearts, there is selfless generosity. And where there is selfless generosity, we see the image of God being restored. The image of God, we are created in His image. And we have this worth. And when we do justice, when we love mercy, and when we walk humbly, we are able to show justice being restored on this earth. Man, we see all kinds of things and we wonder, where is God in this? Where is the justice? Now, God can act in and of Himself that's within His right. But many times, you know, when I look in the book of Acts and other places in the Gospels, God is using His people to bring about justice in the world. So as you go about your week and you look about all the things that are wrong with this world, I want you to think about the ways in which the church can be that open hand and bring some of the right to the world, can bring some of the justice that God wants for us to be dishing out here on this earth. Church, I love you. I miss you. And I pray that you'll think about these things this week. Don't let this be a verse in which you, you shut your Bible and go, well, that was a great lesson. Let's go about our day. Let's go eat some breakfast. Let's go take a nap, whatever it's going to be. 
spend some time dwelling on this. At 11 o'clock today, I'm going to be sending out some discussion questions for you to talk about with your family, online, small groups, with the, somebody you don't even know, or for yourself personally. I encourage you to go through these questions, make them personal, make them real, and let's think about how we can be the open hands of God. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Oakdale family, we're glad you could be with us this Sunday morning. This is our second time to have a live streaming. We hope you enjoyed it. We're trying to improve it to the very best of our ability. So please be patient with us. This is the, one of the most difficult times in the history of our country. Our country is being threatened. When the human invader threatens the United States of America, we know how to meet and fight this invader. But this time it's a disease and it's different. The way we're fighting it, we're told, stay home and do as you're told. This is quite opposite from what our country is all about. And yet there is positives in the situation. We live in the golden age of medicine in 2020. We live in an age when we can share medical breakthroughs in just a matter of minutes rather than years or months. So we have a lot to be thankful for because we live in 2020. Please continue to pray daily. Please continue to check on your neighbors, on your e-group members. Last week, Larry Clutch stressed being safe, being cautious, and being mindful of others. Let us pray at this time. 
Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful that we are your children. And we're thankful that we do not face this new threat by ourselves. That you are with all of us as a father who cares for his children. Pray, Father, that we'll have strength. Pray, Father, that we'll bring our petitions before your throne concerning all that makes up our lives. We pray, Father, that we will be mindful of our neighbor, showing love for all, making sure all are being cared for. Father, we do thank you for this time to serve one another, to be an encouragement to each other, because, Father, that's what it is to be brothers and sisters and children of you. But most importantly, Father, we thank you for that wonderful gift of Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I used to wonder why you didn't seem as obvious as you could be. And Lord, then I began to understand you called this heart of mine to keep your light shining right through me because you've given me this life that I'm not worthy of. And even when I take a fall, you hold me out of. His love is living inside of me. I often wonder. I often wonder why I never seem as obvious as I could be to show all of the world that you've intended for this child of God to give the same love that you gave to me. His love is living inside of me. Oh no, I'm just a man, and I know I don't understand. So I'm placing this life in your almighty hand. Oh, I will consider it. I try to do whatever you might need, Lord, I want to give you everything for all my life. And even when I start to doubt, I hold on to your promises. I'll keep on serving to make sure my life's a living sacrifice. His love, I'm living love, I'm living with Jesus Christ. It's only by His grace that I've forgiven and free in love. I'm living within His life, and I understand this love I'm living because His love is living inside of me. And I understand this love I'm living because His love is living inside of me.